a very um, just wonderful man of the Spirit of God, has studied the Word diligently more than most people I've ever met in my life, um, has lots of wonderful insights. Um, he's going to share some of those with us today. We're hoping that um, in the future we get back to the new building, we get into Bible studies. We think we've talked him into occasionally joining us online um, to kind of weigh in on some topics. So he's... Um, He's very good at getting into the super depths of the, the studies of the Word. So anyway, um, very fun. You all know Adam, the worship leader here. Adam also very studied. I would, I would dare to say I'm more studied than most, and these two are way more studied than me. Uh, so it's going to be a good time for all. Yes, sir? All right. Um, while they work that out, let me switch each of the out so I can do my slides. All right. That's the red ones back there. You want this one, Bill? Is that okay? And then there's this one, too. Yeah. Which good ones do we have? You go, Adam, right here. All right. Technical difficulties? Sorry. All right, so I'm going to try to do this first question. Um, as I said before, we ask everybody to submit questions they had about anything and everything pertaining to God or the church. Um, we can't answer them all because we had too many. What we're going to do is we try to categorize them and we're going to try to cover some of the basic categories the best we can. Um, we're going to circle back to either you, either you individually or we'll answer the other questions on another group question day or online or do podcasts. No question will go unanswered. Okay. Before we even get started, yes, before we even get started, I will say this, that um, because Adam, John the Willard, and myself, we all passionately care about seeking the deeper truths of the Lord, and in that, like everything else in life, there's a little bit of a process and a journey, and we use the word and the meanings and the historical context to help us get there. There are some topics that we still slightly see different. That is okay. We still love each other. We still follow the tenets of Christ. We still can work together. Sometimes we can see how both of our views could work, and we know that we both have room to grow. That being said, give us the same grace we give each other, and if we say something that doesn't make sense to you, don't freak out. Don't panic. It's possible that you disagree with us, and we can still coexist as Christians. It's possible... You or we have room to grow. Love, mercy, grace, we'll all get there together. Amen? Amen. Amen. All right. First question. Um, this came up uh, in several versions. Uh, how do we know we are saved? Um, and with that, they, uh, the idea was people had been taught from other circles that you wouldn't know you were saved until you died and went to your final judgment. All right? The second part of that question is, is it a momentary decision or a progressive reality? We're going to answer these two together. There's also another question that we're going to inadvertently answer right now. And that other question was, um, what's, a, what's a better way to study the word and to actually dig into the original languages and maybe start to connect some of the dots? I'm going to use Logos. I always use Logos. Most guys use Logos who study in depth. Almost every pastor I know uses Logos. There's other apps out there. If you get those, you're on your own. I'm not learning a new app. If you get Logos, I can tell you how to use it on your phone, on your computer, or whatever you may be. Yeah? So we will inadvertently answer the question of how do you go deeper with by using it, and I'm going to do it on the board. Amen? How do we know we are saved? Will you only know in your eternal judgment or not? The answer is, I hope that's not the first time you find out you're saved. All right? <laughs> The way we'll answer how you know is we'll answer the second part. Is it momentary decision or progressive reality? In the church history, the church fathers, they believed that if you were saved, fruit would become out of your life. They believed that your life would begin to transform and look more and more like Christ, and they would call you Christian. You didn't get to just tag yourself that and say, I was saved. So the answer is yes, you will know. And, and, um, and, it's, it, and it is kind of moment in time that you can mark back to that's where I met Jesus and he began to save me. But it is also a progressive reality in that you are continually saved 
because the word saved comes from a word called sozo and it had a vast meaning and i can just i'm gonna pop i'm gonna switch back and forth today so bear with me here um oh lost my search engine because i cut my internet off sorry um i'm gonna have to do that real quick but to show you logos um here's the thing i'll just start talking while that's hooking up sozo is where that word saved comes from it um it was not translated directly as saved it's just kind of a byproduct of the meaning it encompasses and i was going to show you on the board in the bible there it encompasses your physical health your emotional health your immediate well-being being saved from storms being saved from peril it encompasses uh, your in internal world. I think I said that. It also includes your afterlife security or salvation. Yeah, it's salvation of all of you now and then. Does that make sense? Right. Um, so uh, I was going to show you in the search engine how many uh, how many uses they use in, in just in the gospel of being saved. And you'll see that it's when the storm is coming, they're like, save us. When, he's, when they're sinking in the water, when Peter's drowning, save me. When they're sick, save me. When it's, you know, all the save, save, save. It's always this multiple use context, yes? So we're up here. I think I got it up there. There you go. The highlighted one in 13. It says, um, but the one who endures to the end will be saved. This is Jesus talking. And this gospel of the kingdom will be proclaimed throughout the whole world as a testimony to all nations. The gospel is being proclaimed as the one who endures the end will be saved. If you have logos, you hold your finger on that word and then and the definition will begin to pop up. Right there you see, if you can zoom in with your eyeballs, uh, it says, the lima says sozo. That's where I said that word sozo is where it's all pulled from. Now, at some point in time, a group of people produced a system of prayer for, uh, that would bring internal healing and they named it sozo. So you've probably mainly heard that word from that prayer system. Now that prayer system got mixed results because of mixed applications and everybody just got buying a book and thinking they could do it. But that's not what the word means. It means total salvation. Every part of you is to be saved. Now from that, just teach you how to use logos. Once you hit that button more, then you pop into all the, all the meanings of that word saved or sozo. To preserve or rescue from natural dangers and afflictions, to save from death, to bring out safely, uh, save free from disease, keep preserved, to save or preserve from transcendent danger or destruction. Uh, Where's that? Also, next line, save, preserve from eternal death. And on and on and on. You see where we're going with this? It's everything. Sozo is Jesus saving all of you all of you so can you mark the time and date you got saved absolutely what that means is that's the beginning of transformation of your life via the power of Jesus and he's going to save you from everything in your life over time that means by default you can mark multiple salvations in your life this is where he saved my soul and began to heal my heart. This is where he saved me from a car crash because I cried out to him and then everything shifted. This is where he saved me from financial ruin. This is where he healed me physically. This yada, 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 yada. And I will be honest with you. If you walk in the transformative sozo life with Jesus, the last question you'll ever ask is, am I going to heaven? Because you'll understand at that point he's a good king of a good kingdom and he's fully in your life and he is saving you regularly. The further you go, you'll realize daily. And there's no question in your mind of is that king going to accept me into his kingdom? Why? Let's go back to the board here. Because heaven then and now. You'll realize that the king of the kingdom of heaven is in your heart. Jesus said the kingdom's within you. The attributes of the kingdom of heaven are coming to earth. That kingdom come that will be done on earth as it is in heaven. The whole earth is being covered in the glory of the kingdom, which is Jesus. So, yes, this was another question that came up. Do we only believe in heaven 
in us and not in an afterlife. I don't know, it, it, we may have confused some people talking too much about the kingdom within us. Absolutely, there's an afterlife. It's the same thing that's supposed to be in us. You're supposed to die to yourself, giving up your life, taking a new life up with Jesus and never dying again. So it's not that we don't believe in afterlife. We just think it starts quicker than other people do. Like right now. And then it progressively saves you and saves you and saves you. Now, if you have missteps or mishaps in your life, does it mean you're not saved? No. It just means that the salvation you had hoped for, you didn't find in that moment. Keep pressing in. Nobody starts with 100% success. It starts with 100% try. Amen? Yeah. He is good and he will meet you there. He will be with you now and then. And I promise you, if you find him now, you will never question later. Amen? Amen. All right. We're going to um, hold for questions till afterwards. So we're going to just move to the next one. How is the church designed to be governed and led? Who are the leaders? What are their roles? Are some more important than others? Um, this is one of those uh, deep study matters. I'm going to turn over to Adam, I think. <laughs> so when, when we talk about church leadership, um, there's so many different models. And in this room, I imagine half of you have seen different ones. Congregationally led, senior pastor led. There's a number of different board led. Uh, the, the model that we're looking for here uh, is a governing that the scriptures lay out of elders and deacons. And so what that means is, if you go and look in the scriptures, uh, you can find it in Titus. Paul says he sent them there and to go to every city and to elect elders in each city to govern the church there on that island. And so what does, you go, okay, well, that's elders, that's deacons, but like we call him pastor. What does all that mean? Well, then you have this other element, which is what we call the fivefold. And that's a confusing thing for some, it's normal for some, and it can be really ridiculous for others. But what the fivefold is, is this. It's apostles, prophets, evangelists, shepherds, and teachers. And when you look at those, a lot of times, and I, I want to make this a clear denoting mark, if your focus is on the fivefold, your church will be unbalanced. If you're always trying to push what one of the roles in five, and it's, it's not the right way to do it. What it is, is that there are elders that govern the body of Christ. And different elders are going to be graced in different ways. And you're going to be able to distinguish between, let's say, someone who's an apostle and someone who's a prophet or someone who's a teacher. And when you say, okay, well, Adam, what are the distinguishing marks? There are two things that it's simplified, but I just try to unpack it for you. Uh, when an apostle comes into a, a city or to a region and begins to do ministry, one of the things they're going to do when they come in the room is they're going to want to share the gospel like an evangelist would, but they're looking to how to build they want to build a body. They want to build a congregation. They're looking, they look in a room and they go, here's leaders. They look in a room and they go, all right, I see where someone's at. How do I get them to where they're supposed to go? But their focus is on building the work and on finding leaders to begin to put into place and to grow and to disciple. It's a different framework from a prophet. Because when a prophet comes into a room, what they typically are looking for are one of two things, sin and truth. Right? So when they see compromise or sin, they're going to want to speak to it. An immature prophet's going to want to rip it a new one. A mature prophet's going to want to, in love, call you into truth. When they hear something that's untrue, they get bothered. Why? Because their meter is not who are the leaders. Their meter is not how do we build this. Their meter is what is it that God is doing right now? And does it line up with his precepts and his principles? When a teacher comes in the room, the teacher looks at what's in your mind. What are you thinking? How do you see the scripture? Their concern is not about, are you a leader or not a leader? Their concern, a lot of times, isn't about one-on-one -on -one discipleship. Their concern is doctrine. What do you believe and why? And what does it say in the scripture? And so when you find a teacher, a lot of times they want to talk all about what they're reading, all about what they're studying, Greek and Hebrew and this and that. Why? Because they want to know the text. When a shepherd comes in, he's concerned about hearts. He wants you to know that you're connected to a family. That your love, that your sheep within the pasture and the shepherd is going to be helping you. That idea for shepherds is not so much, not that they can't teach, not that they couldn't prophesy, not that they couldn't find a leader, but what motivates them is how is your heart with Jesus and how is your heart with other people in the community? And when you start to find pastors, a lot of times they're, they're more tender hearted, right? Well, they need to be. They're supposed to be handling the sheep. An evangelist comes in and goes, who isn't saved? Who in this room is not saved? 
How do we get them saved? Can we get out of this room? This room is boring. I want to go find the lost. The lost don't hang out in churches. Evangelists are usually weird and wild. I know we have tempered that down to like traveling evangelists at revivals, but that's not like when you look in the scriptures, evangelists go out in the middle of darkness and they're like, I'm going to get some light in here. And so when you find an evangelist, nine times out of 10, they're friendly with sinners. They will offend the self-righteous. They will offend those that think, why? Because they're not concerned with you. You're already saved. They want to go find the lost. And so that's how these five work. But inside of church government, you could be an evangelist in this church and not be an elder. You could be a prophet and not be an elder. You could be any of the five and not actually be chose to govern the local body. You can still operate. You can still have authority in God, but that doesn't mean you're called to govern the church. According to the scriptures, that is the role of elders, and those can consist of the five. The other fun one is this. Apostles govern, prophets, oh, I'm to get this right. Govern, prophets guide, teachers ground, shepherds gather, and pastors guard. And so I'll repeat that again. Apostles govern. Their idea is the government of the church, the structure. Prophets guide. They're following the cloud by day and the fire by night. Teachers ground. They take all of your weird, I saw Jesus moments and go, where is it in the book? Show me. If it's not in the book, maybe you didn't see Jesus. Let's get back to the book. An evangelist wants to gather. Who isn't in the group that needs to be with us that's lost? And then shepherds guard, right? The wolves, they look and they say, what's coming into my body to hurt it or harm it? But, and then the last thought of this is, these are not hierarchical, meaning an apostle is not better than a prophet, and that one's not better than a teacher. When Paul writes in Corinthians, first apostles, second prophets, he's talking sequence. Typically, when churches go out and they're planted, you're going to have an apostolic and prophetic grace probably working if it's going to follow the New Testament model. And that's even in a lot of Baptist churches. If you find a Baptist pastor who's planted lots of churches, talk to him a little bit. He's not a pastor. He's an apostle. He's not going to use that term because that term's outside of his, his denomination. But what's motivating him is going, finding, planting, building, leaving, going, finding, planting. And that dynamic means he's actually operating more like an apostle than a pastor, even though that terminology would be void for him. My responses are not going to be alliterated that well. <laughs> so I'm just saying, thanks, Adam. I'm going to sit between these two guys. My goodness. <laughs> All right. If you need have any more clarifying questions about that. Um, uh, also, the only other thing I would say, just one little tidbit about that, is in the scripture, which we can cover another day. Um, they chose in the beginning of the New Testament church, um, the apostles and the prophets were getting com too many complaints about them not serving the tables well. So they were like, this is not right that we be so distracted with the logistics of, you know, uh, serving this body, although it good. So choose from amongst yourself 12 honorable people, or what, 10, 12? I can't remember. Some honorable people. And, and they chose amongst them deacons. And those deacons took those roles away from them and began to serve the body. I say that to say those deacons who chose to answer their call to serve became the greatest evangelists, teachers, preachers, first martyrs. Like, they became the cornerstones, but it started with service, just like Nobody got to be in the in the other roles without starting with service. So, like, that's what we mean by there's no hierarchy, but there is a progression of this. You got saved today. You're not an apostle tomorrow. I promise you. Vice or any role whatsoever. You got saved today. You're not a deacon today. Just Amen. Just say. And that's good enough. So so is awesome. All right. This was a big one. I have never ever in my life seen a group of women so empowered to be. Thriving in Jesus as you are and yet have this question so prevalent <laughs> So let's state the obvious of what we believe here Adam I believe has actually written a book on this so he's going to this is a colossal topic He's going to give us a quick synapsis, synapsis Synopsis are women able to lead in church if so in what capacity are their roles in church different from their roles in marriage? What do we do with the passage in 1st Corinthians 14 and Timothy 1 2? <laughs> Sorry if I offend you. Um, I know there's probably a lot of teaching on this that you've heard. Um, are women able to lead in the church? Yes. No questions asked. Anyone that's told you otherwise doesn't know how to read a Bible. I'll say it that strongly. Um, it might sound real harsh, but I'm just, the Bible's pretty clear. 
I'll give you a context for that statement and why it was so harsh. The first person that ever read the book of Romans, which is, in our opinion, probably the, the greatest epistle that was written of Paul's, was Phoebe. She's who read Romans to Rome. It's a woman reading inspired scripture for the first time to a city church. Uh, it's a little bit problematic if you don't think women can do that. You go a step further and you say, well, what about you know Mary and Martha and the one sitting at his feet? Well, if you study rabbinical practice, you don't get to sit at a rabbi's feet unless you can become a rabbi. That's why it offended them that Jesus kept letting the women be around. He was letting them sit in roles that implied a future destination that was different than what the Jews of their time thought. Which is humorous because you can still go into the Old Testament and find Deborah who rises up and does all of the things that a judge would do in the time of need. So when we say that women can lead, I, I do mean that. Now, there are some things that we have to discuss in that that might be different than some of you might know. So when we say in what capacity... And whatever capacity the Lord has called them to, right? Like, it's, I don't, just because of, and again, we can go to Galatians, neither male nor female, and what that means in Christ. But the real question is not what your plumbing is. It's what have you been graced to do? And if you've been graced to lead, there'll be fruit of that. It'll be shown in those that you lead and those that you help. But in this church, the one thing we don't want any of you to think is that because you're a woman, somehow there's a glass ceiling on what you can do in Christ. That's, and it's just an errored thinking, and it comes really from a, a Roman society that was so dominant towards males that by the time the Greek fathers started coming in, they literally started pushing women out. And you go, Adam, can you prove that? Yes, at the end of Romans, you have Junia, an apostle. It actually says that she's held in esteem among the apostles. John Chrysostom in the 5th century writes, who doesn't believe in women in ministry, that clearly this woman was an apostle. Don't know how you work those two things together. You don't believe women can be apostles, but the scriptures show one who is. Now you go, okay, Adam, you've hit some things. I got some funny faces looking at me. That's okay. I will talk to you about this after if we need to. The problem that we have in this is sometimes when we say that the church is egalitarian, which is a term, theological term, meaning that women and men can play in the same roles, a lot of times then theologically we carry that over to the marriage and say the marriage is egalitarian. And unfortunately, that is not biblically accurate. It's very, very, very clear that in the home, that the, the man is the head. Now, head does not mean what it meant in the 1950s. Head means source. That's actually what the term means, like the head of a river. That things start from and, and return to the man. And that is not an honor, it's a burden. It means when everything goes kaplooey, you're the one that has to fix it. Right? And I know a lot of them, I'm the head. And I'm like, really? Before you do that, have you washed her with the word? If you can't, are you really a head? Because that's what it says that husbands are to do. If you're not actually investing in your wife, if you're not loving her according to understanding, if you're not serving her in a suicidal fashion, meaning Jesus said, lay down your life as he laid it down for the church. So what parts of your life and headship need to be laid down to serve? So headship is not this thing of like my way or the highway, woman. It's actually, I'm here to serve you and lead you and guide you. And I'm going to do it in such a way that you're going to revere and honor me. Because I'm kind and I'm gentle and I'm understanding. And when we reach an impasse, yeah, I'm going to take the lead here. But that also means it's, the buck falls on me. And if it goes wrong, that's on me. It's a burden, not a place of control. And too often, sometimes men will shift into that, I'm the head. And... Maybe they really haven't loved well. Now, flip side of that. I've met many women, and I've done counseling with my wife with different marriages, where the wife will say, well, my husband's not really a man of God. The scriptures don't say to submit to the man of God. They say submit to your husband. You didn't marry a man of God? Take that up with yourself. <laughs> the scriptures tell you not to be unequally yoked. So if you want to ignore that scripture, don't turn around and then come to this one. So what happens sometimes in marriages is we get annoyed with our spouse and we think we get to change the order. You don't. If you have an unbelieving husband, the scriptures are also clear that through gentleness and submission, you can win him over. It actually says to Paul writes, I'm like, don't fight him about it. Don't tell him they got to be. Go home and love them and be kind to them and be gentle with them and win over their hardened heart through your gracious actions. Right. But in the home, there is a different dynamic than in the house of God. Because in the house of God, the head of the house of God is Christ. 
So there is no, if a woman's legal, well, who's the, it's a woman, Christ is in charge of the church. There's always a male at the front of this church. He's the husband, we're the bride. That's the dynamic. Now the final last two thoughts, and we'll try to wrap this up. Uh, 1 Timothy 2 and 1 Corinthians 14. So 1 Corinthians 14, I think it says, I do not permit a woman to speak. And a lot of times we're like, see, women don't speak in church. It's amazing that they do that because it never applies in any way except for on the sermon. Doesn't apply in Sunday school, doesn't apply in worship, doesn't apply. And it's funny how we do that because that's really cherry picking what that means. Furthermore, in Corinthians, just go back a few chapters into chapter 11. And he talks about how women are to prophesy in the church. Uh, I don't know how you prophesy if you're silent. Um, and so it seems like there's a contradiction here. And here's what it is. Most scholars believe that either the end there of 14 is him responding to something they think is true or is a later addition of a scribe. It's something that got put in that may not have been original to Paul. But no one builds the case against women out of Corinthians any longer. Where they build the case against women is 1 Timothy 2. And uh, if we pull that up, I'm just going to read it to you real quick just so that you have an idea of what I'm referencing. If you're like, Adam, I don't have any idea what this topic is. 1 Timothy 2, what? 1 Timothy 2, I think it's verse 8. Because you, you want to start at 8 and then work your way up. So 1 Timothy 2 and 8, it says this, I desire then that in every place that men should pray, lifting holy hands without anger or quarreling. Likewise also that women should adorn themselves in respectable apparel with modesty and self-control, not with braided hair, gold or pearls or costly attire, but what, what is proper for women who profess godliness with good works. Let a woman learn quietly with all submissiveness. I do not permit a woman to teach or to exercise authority over a man. Rather, she is to remain quiet. For Adam was formed first, then Eve, and Adam was not deceived, but the woman was deceived and became a transgressor. Yet she will be saved through childbearing if they continue in faith and love and holiness with self-control. There's a lot here. I'm going to do it quick. In the first century, mid-50s, a book was written called Ephesiastia by Xenophon. In Ephesiastia, Xenophon writes, and he lays out the ways in which women would dress themselves to go to the temple of Artemis. And in that, every one of the words Paul's using here are used. Now, why is that important to know? Because Paul's dealing with a cultural thing, not a universal thing. And even in Corinth, in Corinth and in Ephesus, you have two dominant female goddesses. You have the oracle at Delphi, who is working on behalf of hearing the gods. And then you have Artemis of the Ephesians. Artemis is a, do is a dominating woman. It's the whole concept of who she is. And some of you may be going, well, the Roman pantheon, Artemis. No, Artemis of Ephesus predates the Roman pantheon. That was actually the goddess of the city before that got brought into their pantheon. And in her, she was a goddess of uh, childbearing. She also was a woman that said that she had never been deceived. And you're, I mean, it's important to know this. Never been deceived. You don't read the stories of Artemis. All of these men are trying to take advantage of her. They're trying to trick her to, to take her virginity. Essentially, what they're trying to do. And they stop. She keeps stopping them. And she proves she's smarter than them and that men are not as smart as women, that women are better than men. And then in the story of her birth, she comes first before Apollo. And then she helps childbear, or helps midwife for Apollo because the, her mother was one of Zeus's mistresses, essentially. And so they can't send the goddess to help because Hera will kill everyone, essentially, is the story. So she takes this role. That's Artemis's background. It's important to know that for this reason. These women that are coming out of the temple, they're stepping into Christianity and they're coming from a place where the strength of women was how well they argued and how well they dominated men. The doctrine of Artemis is that women came first and then men and the idea of leaving the temple would be to lose the blessing of childbirth. Now go back and read through this. I want women to learn in quietness with submission. Well, why? Because everything they learned in the temple said they didn't have to learn that way. And then you go, well, Adam, it says, don't exercise authority. I'm glad you brought it up. That word for authority is not authentic. It's not the word Paul uses everywhere else. It's a very specific term. And in that term, or sorry, is authentic. It's not exusia, I think is the other one. And in that term, that's that word there for authority is not healthy practiced authority. It's actually used by some of the first century writers to mean the maker of a poison, the author of a poison, uh, one that would do harm, one that would brutalize. It's a type of authority where I force you down and I show I'm in charge, which is the type of authority Artemis used. 
Then you go a step further and it goes into, it says, and they'll be saved in childbirth. Hmm. Makes no sense contextually, unless this is a cultural reference. Because you go, why would Paul write, they'll be saved in childbirth? Because when you left the Artemis cult, the great fear you had is Artemis would no longer protect you in childbirth and by default would curse you and you wouldn't be able to bear children. So Paul's right and going, ladies, let's chill out on this Artemis stuff. Stop plaiting your hair and doing all the things you do for a false god and pagan decorations. Stop coming in here with pagan attitudes. Stop teaching that men came after women. He goes back to the garden narrative. He goes, men first, then women. It was the woman who was deceived. It's not to say women aren't smart. It's dealing with Artemis and that she was never deceived. And so Paul's going, let's deal with all of this pagan theology in one little spot. But oftentimes when we read it in the English, we think it's actually saying women can have no authority, women cannot speak, women have nothing to offer. And that's actually not the context going on in Ephesus. I mean, there's really a lot of things in the scriptures that you see is very, well, very well studied on the topic. There are points and counterpoints that can go back and forth. There are volumes and volumes of material that's been written on this. But if you could look at the scriptures and take a look at back and say, what was the original design, right? So we can look at Eden, right? We can all pretty much agree that was the original design. It was supposed to be spread throughout the entire earth. What was Eden and Eden was supposed to encapsulate the whole earth, the glory of the Lord over the whole earth being a tabernacle and dwelling. Now, in Eden, we have Adam and Eve. Which one of him did he confer ruling authority in his name? Does anybody know? Both of them, right. And so you have Adam being a man, you have Eve being a woman, both of them being conferred with ruling authority to represent him throughout the whole earth. So to me, I, I think that's a little bit of a mic drop moment, frankly. That is the design. Yeah. Amen. <laughs> All right. All right. All right, last one uh, before we let the kids go. This will be a super quick one. What are the plans for a future youth group? Um, when we started talking about moving to a new building, a new town, um, that was something we prayed about. The Lord really put in our heart that that was going to become a focus of ours. Um, youth ministry, youth outreach. By default, we have a massive youth program coming up. We currently have um, enough uh, teenagers to start a group I would ask the teenagers bear with us we have another month or so two of, of getting through construction getting through this is like setting up some things and structure the church structure the building that we have to get through before we can really focus because we don't want to you know we don't want to do what God's called us to do in a pathetic fashion we want to do it well so as soon as we get transitioned, as soon as we have the time and attention, we're going to start to focus on the youth outreach that God put in our hearts. We're going to start to figure out how to take the youth that we have and, and support you to the best of our ability so you can grow in Jesus. Also, for everyone, begin to pray that the right youth leader that, that God would have for us begin to emerge quickly and obviously. Amen? Amen. All right, we're going to take a quick break. We're going to let the kids go except for the Lions. The Lions will stay when we come back. We're